Welcome to Getting Your Data Ready for Next Level Uses, a Health System CIO media and production sponsored by Intelligent Medical Objects. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I'll be your moderator today. We're looking forward to your participation. You can send in your questions or comments at any time in the Q&A box, and we'll take them later in the program. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 35, 40 minutes with our main panel discussion featuring Dr. Oscar Markin, Chief Healthcare Data and Analytics Officer with UPMC, Mark Mosel, VP of Enterprise Data Management with Maine Health, and Dale Sanders, Chief Strategy Officer with Intelligent Medical Objects. And then we'll have our Q&A. So let's jump right in. Um, Oscar, let's start with you. Can you give us an overview of your organization and your role? Sure. Uh, thank you for having me uh, here today, Anthony. So uh, I'm Oscar Marroquin. I'm a cardiologist, uh, an epidemiologist by, uh, by background. I still practice um, as a cardiologist, and I'm also the chief data and analytics officer for UPMC. Um, UPMC is a a 24 billion healthcare organization um, that is split into sort of large uh, units. The business uh, of taking care of patients on the provider side, our health services division, as well as an insurance uh, side, which um, has about 4 million members. We have 40 hospitals, about 5,000 um, employed physicians, and um, our mostly in the western part, uh, western and central part of uh, Pennsylvania with some uh, satellite sites uh, internationally. Um, thanks for having me. Very good, Oscar. Thank you. Mark? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Mark Mosell. I'm the uh, IT VP of Enterprise Data Management and Main Health. And uh, Main Health is a not-for-profit uh, health system uh, in Maine. And I've been here about uh, a year and a half, uh, so I'm learning. Uh, but uh, it, we have about 22,000 employees. Um, I think um, eight, eight or nine hospitals um, spread across Maine, and we actually have one in New Hampshire as well. So a large area that we cover, mostly rural. Um, you know, you have the urban setting in Portland, but mostly rural. Um, my role is is overseeing both the data and analytics uh, components uh, at Maine Health, and uh, it, it's been a, it's been a great opportunity so far. I'm very pleased to work for this organization. Very good, Mark. Thank you, Dale. Hey, everybody. Dale Sanders, um, Chief Strategy Officer at IMO. IMO has about 300 employees. Uh, we're fundamentally a terminology company. That's the history of IMO, um, front-end terminology to electronic health records, especially in the problem list. I think we're installed in something like 90% of EHRs, including something like 19 um, international clients. Uh, interesting thing is that 40% of IMO clients don't know that they have IMO. Hmm. And so it's kind of this quiet, um, addition to electronic health records that um, not a lot of people understand. Funny thing, I was IMO's first and second terminology client when I was at Northwestern. So I bought into the concept of um, IMO's uh, business model pretty early. It, essentially, the terminology is a friendlier version of ICD and SNOMED, but still mapped in the background ICD and SNOMED. And we're doing the same thing to other terminologies that are not necessarily clinically friendly or meaningful on the front end, but still have to support international and national reporting standards. So I uh, came out of semi-retirement to try to improve data at the front end of care. You know, I'm kind of known as an analytics guy. I brought data warehousing into healthcare when I was at Intermountain in 1997. And uh, I'm just tired of chasing data quality problems on the analytics side of the data life cycle. So I thought I'm going to try to do something with data quality on the front end, which is why I joined IMO. Thanks, everybody. Great to be here with you. 
Well, got a lot of experience here for our conversation, so uh, you're going to get a lot of good information. Um, all right, uh, Oscar, we're going to start with you. What are the uh, the main causes of poor data quality in health systems? What are some reasons data quality differs from one health system to another? And is data quality generally better in some applications or workflows than others? So wherever you want to jump in there. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... There's certainly many reasons for uh, poor data quality in, in, in healthcare. And I think uh, Dale uh, sort of alluded to it at, at a high level, right? I mean, and, and I think that we suffer from the lack of, um, of standardization, certainly when we talk about um, uh, across health systems, right? I mean, one can get within a health system uh, to certain data quality standards, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are um, transferable to be able to share data across uh, health systems and other things. So unless we more systematically start to adopt um, standards like what Dale spoke about, right, with IMO and, and, and other things, um, and certainly the lack of a national standard for data interoperability and whatnot, um, to be that that is available at this time is is another um, uh, factor that, that lingers, and I would say we have seen it in our system as we uh, have grown and and in all our um, acquisitions and mergers to other hospitals and whatnot that um, traditionally there have been a lot of standards as to how one has to. Um, you know, enter or, or store the data other than what is absolutely required for billing purposes. But for, for clinical care, um, you know, most health systems and individual hospitals have sort of created um, their own standards as to how, how things should get uh, stored. And so there's, there's that part. And then there's also the part related to lack of standardization of uh, sort of processes in, in, in care delivery that a lot of those processes usually lead to uh, inaccuracies in how data gets centered and therefore how data gets uh, stored and, 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 and whatnot. I, I don't know that I would say that I would feel comfortable saying that um, there are, so, which are the applications in which uh, data is of higher quality than others, mostly because, you know, what appears to be of high quality in one hospital using the same system doesn't necessarily translate into the same uh, in another hospital that is still using the same system. And again, perhaps because of our, uh, how we have grown and how we have incorporated different um, both hospitals as well as other well facilities have had the opportunity um, uh, to see that. And then lastly, you know, when we start to surface the data for analytical purposes, when we start to um, make the data a little bit more consumable, it becomes quite evident that there is tremendous heterogeneity in all of these areas. And, and one of the things that we have used is that as an opportunity to hopefully uh, get folks to be more standardized in, um, in how data gets centered, how data gets stored, and how all the different tools that we have at our disposal um, are utilized in a more consistent way. All right, great. A lot there, and we'll, we'll get into more of it. Um, Mark, your thoughts? Yeah, there's, a, there's a, certainly a lot to unpack here, and um, thinking about this, um, there's, there's so many um, causes for data quality challenges. Um, I, I was going to kind of hit that last question that you asked about, which was, you know, is data quality better in some applications or workflows than others? Um, I, I think that is definitely true. Um, if you have... Um, a workflow that is less complex um, with fewer resources entering the data um, that I think would generate a higher quality. Um, if you're entering discrete data uh, versus uh, indiscrete data, non-discrete data, um, that that certainly um, can, can improve quality. Um, 
one of, one of the areas that we try to look at is being able to interface the data directly uh, from systems such as like glucometers. Um, if you can pull that data directly um, rather than have someone manually entering that, um, that results in much better quality. Um, so that's some of the uh, my thoughts on whether an app certain applications or workflows could work better than others. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say at Maine Health, um, you know, we've over the last couple of years been migrating each of our local health systems um, to a, a common EHR. And we've had some challenges with, you know, bringing that data in, the legacy data. Um, each of those hospitals, you know, over time had used different technologies. Um, they have maybe preferences um, or uh, at certain at, in certain uh, workflows and aspects, um, and all that drives uh, data uh, quality differences. Um, one of the things that we try to look at is being able to validate or check the data uh, when it's when it's being entered. Um, I think if you can have that as part of the process, um, that certainly drives. Uh, better data quality. Um, I think probably one of the main challenges that we've seen with data quality is really a, a lack of of time. Um, and you know, there's so many constraints on the time of our care team um, to you know after they spend time with the patient or or perform their procedures to then be able to enter that data. Um, and if you know that's if you don't have enough time to do that, uh, the data may be incomplete or there could be mistakes uh, in that data entry component. So that's that's some of the challenges that we see as well. Um, right, so Mark, it, it, that's an interesting issue just as a quick follow-up. Um, one of the things that people had wanted to get away from was sort of a clinician with their face in the laptop while they're dealing with the patient, right? So the clinician may want to do it because um, they feel like they're able to document better in real time as opposed to having to remember and go to the computer. The patient may like it because they feel like being listed, but there's a downside to documenting after is what you're saying. You can easily get pulled on to the next thing and then it's incomplete and then we have the data problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, if if uh if the provider or the care team has a, a busy schedule, they may not be able to document everything until later in the day. Um, and, and, you know, that presents challenges. So we look at options to try to um, automatically generate that information, um, you know, and if, there, if there's any way to, to pull some of that information, uh, you know, from an inpatient use case um, directly from, from the instruments using interfaces and things, that's certainly preferable. Very good. Dale, your thoughts on what you've heard? Well, I agree with Oscar and Mark on all these things. Um, you know, especially I want to mention and reinforce what Mark said about the burden of data collection we put on clinicians, right? All of us have to say no more clicks, right? Whatever we do to improve data quality in healthcare, we can't add additional clicks to a, a clinician's day. So my I, leveraging that, the valuable time that we do ask clinicians to enter data should be the highest priority, most useful data. And part of the problem we have with data quality is actually quality measures. Um, because quality measures generally are very single purpose data collection motives, right? You're collecting very specific data to meet a very specific quality measure. It doesn't have multiple uses. So if we would back up, and say, look, we just want to collect data about patients like me who were treated like this, had outcomes like this. Those three categories, patients like me, right, the, sort of the demographics of who I am as a patient, how I was treated, what kind of orders, what kind of procedures, and what were my outcomes. Then you can slice and dice that general purpose data to any quality measure you care about. But what we're not doing right now is we're not collecting general purpose data for the most part. The burden that we're putting on clinicians is too single purpose around reimbursements. Then, you know, back to what both Oscar and Mark said, the underneath those 
those reimbursement motives, we haven't implemented standard terminologies well. And, and part of it is we didn't implement it, but part of them, those terminologies are not useful to a clinician. Like LOINC, you're never going to put LOINC in front of a clinician. SNOMED, not clinically friendly to a physician entering diagnosis data. ICD is made for public health reporting, and we use it for billing. So a lot of these terminologies are not clinically friendly to the physicians who are actually entering the data. And so we've got to, and that's kind of where IMO, that's why I bought IMO when I was at Northwestern, is it made SNOMED and ICD usable for a clinician. Right, and I, Mark and Oscar, you're probably familiar with what IMO looks like on the front end of an EHR, right? It's a lot more clinically friendly. So we've got to do something like that with the other terminologies as well. And if I can add, Anthony, to what I agree with what Dale said, and as a clinician, right, when I am um, seeing a patient, my the problem list that I see because it has. Uh, because of IMO, it, the, all of those terms make clinical sense, right? I mean, and so um, I can actually understand when I'm preparing to get in to see a patient so that I don't spend a whole lot of time looking at the screen when I'm with the patient, uh, but I do a lot of the preparation before. I already have an idea of what that patient phenotype is because I can leverage um, a lot of the the tools that are available, right? From a, whether it's a problem list, prior diagnosis and, and, and other things. But I also agree with, with Dale in that a lot of what we have tried to um, get our clinicians at UPMC is to be more consistent in the types of data domains that are going to be useful to, uh, to answer a multitude of questions, mm -hmm. right? I mean, and, and there's a lot of folks that do work behind the scenes um, to try to get us to, you know, check the box for quality reporting and other things. But the clinician's time should be, as, as was very well said by both Dale and Mark, spent with um, what are the, the bare minimum general data domains that are useful to answer a multitude of questions and then being able to spend time um, you know, dealing with the patient's needs and, and, and what not with the very limited amount of time that, that we have. And I think that newer technologies like uh, Abridge, which is a company that was funded by uh, one of my colleagues here at UPMC and that can take the ambient conversation and through uh, generational language models can actually, generational AI with, uh, can, can actually create a summary for both the patient as well as a summary that can be used for a note for the provider. Which, so if we can actually, in a more intelligent way, utilize technologies like that, it will decrease the burden that we put on our providers to be making more clicks and spending the majority of their time looking at the screen rather than having the meaningful conversations that um, they need to have with with, that we need to have with our patients. Oscar, as you talked about uh, ambient technologies, uh, sort of collecting the information that they, that they gather and uh, turning that into data. Um, I think Mark mentioned that, you know, you get better data when it's discrete. So those two don't quite go together, right? Because you're talking ambient thing is gonna collect some sort of unstructured note, um, it doesn't sound to me like that would turn into high quality data unless you had a lot of curating of it. So what are your thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, so just expecting that we're going to um, uh, derive from a plain recording of the conversation meaningful data would be um, uh, completely naive. But the, one of the advantages of, of, in this case, a bridge is that they've, they spent a lot of, time training their models to be able to transform the conversation and the terms into structured data points behind the scenes. And then those structured data points are then used to do, uh, to generate uh, sentences and terms that actually make clinical sense. So it is uh, all the steps that they need to take in order to be able to synthesize the conversation 
has to go through the process of deriving insights from what was discussed, condensing it, and then generating, again, with they have a very large uh, language model behind the scenes that was trained with a multitude of, of uh, uh, patient encounters to be able to then make sense of those conversations. So the, in my mind, they, they're actually not mutually exclusive, but rather a one step uh, further in our ability to uh, be able to discretize data that originally would be uh, is completely unstructured. Mark, what are your thoughts? Well, interestingly, Maine Health is is looking at a similar product and is actually being uh, tested in a, uh, with a couple of clinics at this point. And you know, I think by having that specific model that's doing that uh, translating and documenting. Um, that adds a consistency um, that that maybe you don't see um, with each provider entering, you know, their own information um, or you know the clinical notes being added by individuals. Um, if that's being translated and documented through through a model, um, I would think that that would add some consistency and would help with with data quality. Dale, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, obviously, everyone, everybody wants to move, as you were saying, to put less of a burden on the clinician. So we want these technologies to capture through audio and AI, picking up what's going on in the room and all that data documentation. We would love for that to be done behind the scenes and turned into discrete data and really good. But as, as a data person, does this make you nervous about the resulting quality? Uh, no, not really, friend. It doesn't make me nervous about the quality. I think because our quality is pretty bad, we've got a low benchmark <laughs> already. Yeah. And so, um, no, I'm a big fan of products like the bridge and, um, I think, I think they have a really bright future. You know, one of the things we should kind of keep in mind is that, um, large language models are interesting. They're fascinating. Um, and they're going to have an impact, but, um, the, the large language models that are being used by a lot of the NLP vendors, and by the way, we're in the middle of a big NLP initiative at IMO. Uh, they're informative, but the truth is healthcare has its own language models, right? Um, and, and so in some ways, IMO is actually a language model in, um, in the NLP space because we've been curating millions of terms you know, for 20 something years. So uh, there's, there's going to be room for improvement on top of these large language models that's more fine-tuned for healthcare. And we haven't quite figured out how to do that in healthcare yet, um, because if you go to just one institution and you fine-tune your model for that institution, like Maine Health, for example, and UPMC, those are two very different um, patient types and populations that they're treating, right? And your language model is gonna reflect that, has to reflect that difference, I would say. And the other thing I would mention is that um, as we build out these fine-tuned language models based on the clinical notes that are in EHRs right now, our clinical notes aren't that great. And I'd love to hear Oscar uh, respond to that, but at least 50% of a clinical note is copied and pasted from somewhere else in the record. So it's it's not really a fine-tuned representation of a patient. And I learned this at Northwestern, you know, that um, we ran a test and concluded that there's an inverse relationship between the value and the quality of a note and its length. Uh, and so we've got to get away from this notion that, that um, size matters in uh, clinical notes. Well, I completely, completely agree with you, Dale, that um, first, we have seen the same thing of the inverse relationship between the length of the notes and uh, and the quality. And, and one of the things that um, we have also spent a fair amount of time with a documentation uh, modernization initiative is to also, again, going back to what we said earlier on getting our provide, providers more focused on what are sort of the key things that are important uh, in documentation in the note. Let's not continue to just perpetuate um, narratives or which often come with errors and other things by the 
cotton pasting phenomenon and, and, and whatnot, right? And, and let's actually put in time in the areas where um, we district discrete data is a little bit more challenging in trying to understand what is the reason why the patient is here and, and all of those different things, as well as the reasoning behind why we are going to be doing what we're doing, right? And so if we put in our time in, in our notes there, um, that is where we, in the future, feel that these large language models can actually gain uh, to be trained from, from more meaningfully and, and uh, explicit, succinct notes uh, can get us to. Because if we train them with the, all this stuff that gets put out, especially when we take all the uh, inpatient or for folks who are hospitalized, all of those encounters become so repetitive it becomes actually hard to figure out um, the meaningful information um, on each note. So yeah, your point is, is, is well taken and represents a great opportunity. I, I would just add, um, you know, there's, there's so much value um, in the clinical notes um, and, and NLP has been a great tool um, for, for a number of years to be able to access uh, that information and and uh, transition that to discrete data, uh, whether it's for you know reporting and analytics or or for other purposes, um, and that can actually help with data quality by pulling in that additional information and um, combining that with uh, the discrete data that's entered. It gives you more of a complete picture. It gives you an opportunity. Um, to uh, you know, look for inconsistencies or or consistencies um, that that could be pointed out and reviewed. So uh, there's there's great opportunities with with clinical notes, and certainly using NLP uh, with that can help drive uh, quality improvement. All right, very good. <clears throat> Next question: How can a health system determine the quality of its data in any particular area? I thought of an analogy. I spent some years in my younger days as a lifeguard. You would get a little water out of the pool. You'd put a drop of something in it and see what color it turned. And that would tell you what you needed to do with the water. Is there anything like that for data? You know, we talked about, you might not have, certainly have a uniform consistency across your health system. You might have pockets of data in different applications or workflows that are higher quality than others. So. Is there something like that to, to, to do a little pH test and say, oh, this is pretty good data, we can use this or or not? And does data quality need to be of a, above a certain threshold before it can be used for clinical decision-making? I think uh, the term sourced was used or surfaced, surfacing the data for a second level use. I think Oscar, you said that. Um, so let's start with you, Oscar. Um, how can you tell if what you're working with is is good? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. I would say, um, well, certainly from an IT perspective, there are tools that you know are my uh, our team that is doing ETL or doing data replication or uh, that doing data quality checks can can um, auto, in an automated way look out for duplication of records or making sure that we're not losing attributes when we're doing replication and all these different things. What we have found um, to be an area that we have spent a lot of time and an area of focus is anytime we start an analytics project with, with a group, um, we start with a, an ex exploration and discovery session because very, very frequently, it is the first time that the clinicians or the administrators have had the opportunity to look at this data um, sort of together, surfaced in a way that allows for um, easy, easier identification of, of issues or whatnot than you would get if, if the only thing that you get is an, a data extract. And so, you know, we, we, we do spend um, a lot of time with our clinicians with the folks that work with us um, early on in the process to say, you know, you have to be an active participant in helping us assure um, that the, what is the data quality of the data set that, that we have put together. And so 
uh, and we asked them that part of what we wanted to do is to uh, go back and help us verify the um, accuracy uh, of the data. We can certainly get a sense from, uh, you know, the completeness um, of the data from, from how much missing data is there and, and, and all, all these different things. And also to sometimes the, the data as when we surface it, uh, perhaps tells us something uh, when we only look at the data, but if you go back and actually understand the process as to how those data points were entered, perhaps they were meant for other things, right? And so we are big believers that um, before we, we get to the point where we are sort of putting a, um, the first part of every project always has to involve uh, an exercise of exploration and discovery through which we rely on the subject matter experts in that, in that area to be able to uh, help us do uh, validation and, and uh, other exercises where oftentimes the clinician input and clinician subject matter expertise uh, is required. And so we have found that to be a, um, a very important aspect, which in turn allows us to, when we identify issues, uh, perhaps be able to make changes to our processes or how we have our clinicians or frontline staff or whoever um, entering the data, right? And so, because in the end, just identifying issues um, for the sake of identifying them uh, doesn't really help us, right? We wanna use them as an opportunity for uh, improvement um, in how we are collecting the data as we move forward. Quick, quick follow-up, Oscar. You, you, you said that the users of, of the data have to be active participants in, in, your, in your efforts to try and improve data quality and determine data quality. How, how, how willing are you finding them to be of assistance and to give you some time? Yeah, no, again, that's another great question. That One of the advantages that we have had here and how we have positioned our data and analytics operations has been um, that we are providing a service to the clinical operations folks um, but one that while they may not have to, you know, come up with a budget uh, to pay for our services, we do expect that um, their active participation uh, in the process to help define the question, to help do data quality and, and all of those things. And I'll tell you, those are part of the conversations that we have early on in the process that I personally have with whether it is a service line lead or whether it is a president of a hospital uh, or others in that um, we say, look, we're gonna take care of all of the behind the scenes work that is needed to, to do this. But we, in order for this to be a meaningful exercise and for us to build you a meaningful tool or whatever it may be, um, we need you to be an active participant in the process. And I'll, I'll just add one more example of why is that very important, right? When we, when we get to the point where the perhaps the deliverable is a predictive model that uses um, machine learning to generate a probability of something that tends to be more black box in how it reaches its conclusions. Um, if you have not been part of the process early on to understand the strengths and weaknesses of the data and all of these different things, it's, it's very difficult to gain trust in, in these models um, after they get developed, right? And so we have found that the, the uh, act, when I mean active participation is really that I say that my team and the clinical operations folks uh, are, we, we work hand in glove in, as part of the continuum because it is what has allowed us to sort of move the, the, the the operation forward in a more meaningful way, if you will. Great, Mark, um, I think this is a really important point I'd like to get your opinion on. I find that the hardest parts of these C-suite level and VP level jobs is not sort of head down doing whatever you could do on your own. It's getting people to, to do what you need them to do to help you and to get the work done. It's that hu those pesky humans, right? So. Yeah. 
Um, what are your thoughts about, you know, what what do data leaders like, like yourself need from the users of the data in order to get their data better? What do you need from them? And how do you convince them? Because it's all about time, right? Clinicians don't have a free minute, Oscar, you know that. The, so how, how do you convince them, give me some of your time because it's going to benefit you and your patients? Well, I, I couldn't agree more, um, you know, in, in IT or in, in your data and analytics teams, you, you don't have the expertise across um, all, the, all those different areas. Um, and you need those subject matter experts as, as real partners, right? And, and I think you can, you can en en entice that partnership uh, by making a value proposition. And, and, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we, we would have financial uh, data extracts that we would do. Um, we would have basic uh, validation row counts and things that Oscar was mentioning. Um, you know, did we get all the all the columns for this particular row? You know, do we have all the values in place? Um, and then that data would go out to the groups that were that were leveraging that data. This and they're the subject matter experts, and then they would do their own validation. Uh, on top of that, so almost a statistical analysis or looking for particular outliers, um, and so so we said, well, you know, what what kind of uh, checks are you doing? And they they went through their whole process, and we converted that into a script, and then we made that part of our process. So by the time they got the data they knew that we had not only done our checks, but we had also done their more robust validation process as part of our, our work. And the data was, they didn't have to worry about that piece. It was automated and completed. And if, if, if um, there was an issue that came up in the data, we would identify it sooner. We reached out to them, we, we fixed it, and then we reran uh, the extract. So, um, it, it, it was a, it was a, it provided value for them, right? Because they didn't have to do this work themselves. Um, they knew it was automated. Uh, so th that's an example of how you can drive that partnership. Um, I think it's all about offering value. So Dale, you work with a lot of health systems and you were obviously a CIO at different places for many years. What are your thoughts on um, the key partnerships that data leaders need to establish in order to further the goal of improving data quality? Well, I, this is where I, I get into the psychology of data and the soft side of data strategies. You know, if you, if you can't convince the people that are entering data that data quality is important to their job, and what I, I borrow Daniel Pink here, mastery, autonomy, and purpose, right? That's what everybody's motivated by, mastery, autonomy, and purpose. That is, the data that they're entering, um, the quality of that data has an impact on the mastery of their job, their autonomy of working alone without being micromanaged, and their sense of purpose. Um, you're probably not going to have a long-term data quality strategy that works. Right. And so you, I think it's super important to address these soft issues. You know, I joke, half joking, full truth that we're we're not homo sapiens or homo economicus. And and if if data quality doesn't matter to sort of the social and or tangible currency of the people that are entering the data, you're never going to win the data quality journey. Right. You're going to constantly chase yourself. That said, we can make it a lot easier and a lot more transparent for the people entering data to make data quality easy for them. So they don't really have to worry about it. I think Mark mentioned early on, you know, data validation checks on the front end of care. Amazing how many EHRs we deployed without any kind of uh, checks and balances on the validity of data entry, right? We kind of high tech didn't encourage any of that. So, you know, you really have to address the soft side of these relationships on the data quality journey up front. And I, I think also what Mark and Oscar were mentioning is that certainly in the analytics space, you have an obligation not, not to introduce further errors and mistakes. And that's kind of where going back and engaging the trust and the faith in the domain experts that you're at least not introducing any further errors, you know, is super important. But moving upstream to that, 
make it easy for the data entry folks to enter data the right way with validity checks up front, you know, minimizing the complexity of how they enter data. Um, I think those are super important areas. I, I, I want to mention one thing before I forget it. I've used a simple data quality algorithm for years. And that is data quality equals completeness times validity. And we're actually building out a tool at IMO so that we can go in and quickly profile data quality in a client's data set around that simple algorithm. So completeness is relatively computable. If you look for nulls, you know, where, where you think you should see data, you're looking for nulls. Validity is a little more complicated because it can be very use case dependent. But the first thing that you can do with validity is just make sure that it bounces up against the proper terminology for what it's supposed to represent, you know, procedures, orders, labs, meds. You're bouncing that against a reference data set to see if there are any gaps between what was entered and what the standard should be. So that's the first step in validity. Validity can get pretty complicated beyond that. But um, both of those are relatively computable, right? Nulls and validity checks against a reference data set, that's relatively computable. So we're building out a tool at IMO to go in and quickly profile data quality so that health systems have an idea of that right up front. And then you can kind of start plotting your data quality strategy from there. Excellent. Uh, nice formula, Dale, by the way. I like that. <laughs> Very good. Um, all right, let's a uh, quick audience question here. Will US CDI have any effect on data quality? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question. I mean, US CDI is great in that it expands the kind of data that we should be collecting about patients. That's the really good news. It rounds out that multi-purpose data that we talked about earlier. Um, but it's not specific yet enough about how to implement the standards for data that should be supported. And I'll give an example, SDOH, right? We all know that SDOH is important for analytics and secondary use, but the standards are kind of all over the place right now. USCDI recognizes the need for SDOH data, but there's no standard reference from which we should um, instantiate the data collection. So I like USCDI, but it needs to be more specific about the data standards underneath it. Oscar, anything on USCDI? No, nothing other than what, what All right. Dale said. All right, very good. Um, let's uh, do our Ask a Co-Panelist section. I, I love to hear what you guys come up with. Uh, Dale, I'm going to let you go first. Do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? Uh, I have, yeah, here's a question, friends. So uh, this is kind of IMO-centric. Um, when I was at Northwestern, I had the privilege of owning the EHR relationships and the analytics platform. So I, I had, you know, with my buddy Tim's off, we, we had end to end responsibility for the data. One of the things that I did is I moved that IMO terminology with all of its mappings to ICD and SNOMED. I moved that over into the analytics environment and we would query our data warehouse through the IMO terminology. Um, and I'm just curious, have, have, are you folks at UPMC or Maine Health, are you doing that? Have you carried the IMO terminology down into the data warehouse? Yeah, I mean, I can certainly speak for us. We, that, that has been uh, our approach as well. Uh, Dale, just because it, for several reasons. Number one, we have multiple EMRs and because we have multiple EMRs, you know, we would then have to query all of those things uh, multiple times in this each source system if we left it on that side. Where, whereas our warehouse becomes the place where we have make, made everything uh, harmonized and interoperable, and then can use uh, things like IMO to be able to ask questions that allow us to answer regardless of what the source system uh, point of entry was. And so, yeah, we have certainly a taken that approach and it has made us gain uh, sort of tremendous efficiencies and actually be able to do things that before uh, we were not able to do. That's Mark? great. And from Maine Health standpoint, fortunately we don't have the challenge of multiple EHRs, but uh, I know we do use IMO 
um, and that data does come into our our um, enterprise data warehouse. So um, it, it is valuable as far as um, integrating with other data sets and and providing that um, more easily understood uh, definitions and language. Um, that's certainly helpful. Very good. Mark, do you have a question for one or both of your co-panelists? I did. Um, maybe maybe this, I'll start with Oscar. Um, one of the questions, one of the thoughts that I had while thinking about this was, you know, what, what type of um, process do you have in place um, if somebody identifies some data quality issues, how do they make that known? Um, how do they bring that to the attention of the people that need to uh, to look at that? What what process do you have at uh, UPMC? Well, that's a that's a great that's a great question. We have, um, you know, when we started, it was mostly based on the sort of close relationships between the uh, folks cons using using the data as well with the analysts on the analytics team, if you will. And so we always, um, uh, we always tell folks that the relationship that we build with them is not a one and done. It's not like we build them an application and we walk away, but rather we're there for improvements, whether they are related to data quality or whether they are related to maturation of their program, for example, that perhaps requires different um, analysis, different code to be written, whatever it may be. And so, uh, and then we have matured it in a way that um, now we have many more users uh, using our applications on a daily basis. And so we have portals where uh, folks can also raise any of those issues. And in the past, all of those perhaps would go to um, either the EMRs or, or, or whatnot. And we have said, you know what, we're going to centralize all of those efforts because the warehouse is the place where we're integrating everything. And if we need to go back to the front end of one of our systems, we, my team takes point on doing that so that uh, we have sort of tried to standardize the process a little bit. Now, that makes sense. And, you know, I think the easier that we can make it uh, to, to report data quality issues, uh, you know, that's that's important information and that that obviously helps drive data quality. So. Um, that sounds like sounds like a good process, and and we do something similar at Maine Health as well. Thanks Dale, any, Dale, any comments on what you've seen work well, or what <laughs> you would recommend? Um, no, not other than what Mark and Oscar just mentioned, friend. But they did stimulate another question. I'd like to run by them, <laughs> please. Um, this is a little bit of a, a product survey here, friends. Um, we've been talking about data quality, kind of at a granular level. But I have a, an assertion, a theory that um, we also have a problem at the value sets level. So if you, if you think about all the challenges we have managing terminology and standards at the vocabulary level, um, one of my CMIO friends mentioned this to me a few months ago that he's managing over 400 different value sets. And so, um, and I've experienced this too as a CIO and CAO. Uh, so to that end, you know, we're building out a product called Precision Sets and IMO that's all about kind of think about what GitHub did to software engineering. We're trying to replicate that concept of reuse and forking and governance and promotion in value sets and, and data engineering, just to make it easier to manage value sets, uh, both the ones that you're required to comply with for billing, reimbursement, accreditation, but also for those that you want to develop for local quality improvement initiatives and clinical trials and that kind of thing. So what do you guys think? Is that a, is that an IMO product we should continue developing on? I hope you say yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it sounds very interesting. Um, you know, I think when you're talking about, you know, promotion and, and development process, um, I'm, my, my thoughts always turn to automating as much as possible. And you know, collecting that metadata at, at each step of the process. So if 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 what this potential product that you're talking about uh, has you know automated capabilities and can do that for uh, value sets, that that does sound intriguing. Does that does that number four hundred? That was for about a fifteen hospital system, by the way, Mark. Four hundred mm -hmm. values. Does that sort of sound like the ballpark? 
Is that reasonable number? Sounds like a lot um, <clears throat> compared to what I'm familiar with, but but those are ones that uh, you know are at Main Health. We have so many documented, right? But there may be a lot that are undocumented um, that we just don't know about. But uh, yeah, it, it, that seems okay. I would agree. I think that's a ballpark number that I would. I, 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 it makes sense uh, to me. And I also agree with Mark that it would be of use. Um, they, I mean, certainly up until now, all of those exercises have been, the only way to like do it has been like brute force of trying to like, you know, uh, mix and match and understand all of those, all the variability and everything and having uh, tools and libraries and other things that one can leverage would certainly provide a lot of value. Great. Well, maybe I'll, I'll circle back and wrangle you guys into being part of the development circle or something here. <laughs> Great. You are. Awesome. Awesome. Look, we're making deals. We're making <laughs> deals. Very good. Well, listen, um, let me get a quick, we get a, I'll call it a lightning round final thought. Um, and I'll frame it up to you this way um, for Oscar and Mark. Well, your best piece of advice to someone in a comparable position at a comparable sized health system to your own. So somebody kind of sitting in the same kind of seat you do, what's your best piece of advice? You know, your experience over the years, hey, this is something I've I've done that, that kind of works well and, and has helped uh, move us forward. So Oscar, I'll go with you first. Yeah, I mean, I... I... I would say, uh, perhaps, I will acknowledge that perhaps it's a comment that's biased by the fact that um, I, I practice as a clinician, but to me is, we've, the three of us have said it in different ways, that, that partnership between the data team, the analytics team, working in conjunction with the folks that are uh, in the trenches providing the care, to me is um, a critical uh, step in being able to, uh, to achieve the success um, that having all of this digitized data, the compute power that we now have and everything else affords us to, to be able to uh, derive insights that can actually drive change for the better. And I would say, otherwise, you know, we, we are just doing data, we're using the data and the analytics for the sake of doing that, but without having the impact that it could have if we have a close partnership with those who are um, actually on the front lines. Mark? Uh, yeah, one of the things that, that I've been thinking a lot uh, about lately is, is how we structure our analytics and data folks in an organization. And, you know, there's, there's a disparate model, a centralized model, a hybrid model. And, you know, I think if you want to really, really positively impact data quality, you don't want to centralize um, those resources. You want to leave them in with their business units embedded in those business units and rather, rather look at them as almost like franchises um, of your analytic teams and just aim towards transparency of, of what they're working on and drive towards standardization, whether it's tool sets or processes, um, you know, techniques for validation, et cetera. So I think having those embedded out analysts in their uh, business units um, really helps grow their data literacy uh, in their respective areas and helps, helps with the subject matter experts when it comes time to really identifying quality issues. Very good, Dale. Your final thought. Um, I'll go a little. I'm going to go philosophical here for a second and, and emphasize the the soft skills um, of of a data strategy, um, and in particular with physicians now, they feel like they're overmeasured and they're overwhelmed with data that doesn't really affect their mastery, autonomy, and purpose. And so I think a lot of times as data professionals, we measure our success by the number of dashboards we put out. But I don't think we need more dashboards, right? We need to give physicians the data they need in a tight, succinct way where they are. And for the most part, they're either in the EHR or they're on their mobile device. 
right? So I would just say, be careful about feeling that, you know, more dashboards is better and try to figure out a way to have a lot of empathy for our physicians and, and nurses right now and meet them where they are with the data that they need in the medium that they need. Well, that's perfect. It, it reminds me of what you were saying before about how there's an inverse correlation between the size of a node and the quality, right? We don't need more all the time. We just need the right information in the right spot and less is often more. So yeah, exactly, friend. Yeah. Wonderful. Wonderful. We're about out of time regarding continuing education. You can use the final slide in this deck. You will get, receive an email when the on-demand recording of this event is ready for viewing. If you want to sponsor an event with us, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team. You can go to our website to register for upcoming panels. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel, Dr. Oscar Marikin, Mark Mussel, and Dale Sanders. And I want to thank Intelligent Medical Objects for sponsoring and making this event possible and our attendees for joining. But with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.